In design-build projects, managing design and construction interfaces is crucial for success. This research explores the role of the design integration manager, who ensures the project vision is realized by liaising between the lead designer, construction manager, and owner. Through workshops, interviews, and surveys, the team identified the role's core responsibilities and competencies. The Design Builder's Guide to Design Management provides guidance for hiring, training, and developing these managers. This presentation will discuss how this role enhances decision-making, resolves issues, and improves design integration. Here to present, please welcome Brian Franz, Mark Rothman, and Judy Masqueda. Great, good afternoon everybody. Um, thanks for being here today. It's my pleasure to be here today. I'm Mark Rothman with Hensel Phelps. I wanna start off by thanking CII PIP and the Charles Fang Pankow Foundation for sponsoring the research that we're gonna to present today. Without them, we couldn't have been here, so uh, we're very thankful that they had the foresight and vision um, to, to sponsor this research. So all presentations have to have learning objectives, so uh, we're no different. Um, so at the end of this presentation or discussion, we'd really like you to walk away with an understanding of the importance of design integration and management and collaborative project delivery. You should be able to explain how the role of design integration management uh, can ensure a unified construction effort. And then finally, you'll be able to recognize the key competencies a design integration manager should have for the projects, right? So when I say design integration manager, Brian's gonna talk about this a little bit in a second. There's other names for what we're talking about. So, um, so due to the multiple sponsors of our process, um, we did things a little bit differently than you would normally see in a CII RT, but that's okay. Um, it's still uh, done with researchers and uh, uh, stakeholder uh, engagement. So we move from, uh, start out, sorry, apologize. So what was the motivation for the research? So we wanted to better define design integration, specifically the role and importance of the design integration manager. And then what is a design integration manager? So I wanna make sure I cover that so you all have a good understanding of what we're talking about. A design integration manager could be considered the glue uh, the conductor of a collaborative design process, also uh, the secret sauce in that. That's really the person that sits at the center of that universe. It helps bring everything together, not only in design, but as the design progresses all the way through construction. So it's the person or persons on a collaborative design delivery team who organizes and manages the activities of all the design entities on a project. So typically, we have different ways to deliver projects, right? So less collaborative is our traditional, original design bid build. And then we move to construction uh, manager at risk. Now, I would like to say that is somewhat collaborative, but not in the true uh, manner in which we're gonna discuss, but I, I highly recommend employing design integration management as part of CM at risk. So finally, that brings us to um, design build, EPC, and integrated project delivery, right? These are what we really, when we talk about collaborative uh, design delivery and project delivery, these are the ones we're really talking about. And then finally, design integration is crucial uh, to that. And so why is that important to CII and its membership? So the pers the, this person, the design integration manager, supports many CII initiatives specifically collaborative and integrated project delivery, advanced work packaging, modularization and off-site construction, and finally, industrial integrated project delivery. So the guide in the playbooks that we're gonna talk about today um, are the result of shared experiences of subject matter experts, and so we have one of those subject matter experts here today, and that's Judy Mosqueda, and she's gonna come talk to you. 
afternoon. Uh, I'm Judy Mosquera, Chief Development Officer at San Francisco International Airport, and you will frequently hear me refer to SFO, San Francisco International Airport, just so that you're familiar. At SFO, our airport director challenges us to deliver exceptional projects where delivering on time and on budget is just the basic bar of project delivery. And we are challenged to deliver projects that not only benefit our passengers and the airport, but also benefit our business partners, the community, and the environment. And we use measurable project outcomes to chart and deliver our successes. Um, but more importantly, or just as importantly, we use progressive design build for all of our larger, uh, more complex capital improvement projects because we've found that we can deliver better projects faster using this method. And just as a bit of background, progressive design build at SFO, we use a qualifications-based selection process, and yet we also include a component for cost. However, with that, we try to maximize the impact of qualifications and minimize the impact on cost. Um, and we do so by limiting the cost factor to just the management fee, overhead and profit, bonds and insurance, and a programming phase fee from our design build teams. We go through the programming phase together to validate the scope, the schedule, and the budget of the project as defined in the RFP with our stakeholders to make sure that SFO delivers the best project we possibly can. We know we need to live with these projects for the next 30 to 50 years, and we don't want to deliver something just because it was written in the RFP. We want to deliver it because it's going to serve us well in the long run. And if you've Travel through SFO, you might know we do things a little differently. Uh, we've established a culture of uh, collaboration and trust with our design builders, and we work with an open book setting. And very similar to the session this morning where that culture is so important, we understood that from about 15 years ago, 20 years ago when our international terminal was delivered, and we weren't terribly happy with what we uh, the final product. We made some mistakes in that and have learned since then to deliver projects better. In the photos here, you can see that we also use a big room uh, for project delivery. We co-locate to help with that cult team culture, um, working on developing relationships and trust with our design and build teams. And what we've learned over uh, the past 15 plus years of implementing progressive design build projects is that uh, the design management process is very important. Um, and so at SFO, we have design management responsibilities in three different places in our project teams. There's a design integration manager in the builders team. There's the traditional design manager in the design team responsible for the coordination of all the sub-consultants' work. And then uh, we also have a design manager on the, representing the owner. And this is to ensure that our stakeholders are fully engaged in the project and that their input that they're uh, giving to the project team is dealt with, either incorporated or not incorporated because of a specific reason, and that they get that feedback. But today, we're here to talk about the role of the design integration manager in the builder's team. And we've uh, found this to be such a critical project uh, process for having a good design integration manager. Um, let's see. We found that with intentional de design integration, we can achieve better projects. But it's really somewhat of an emerging understanding that this role is so critical. Um, at SFO, this is a role that we examine carefully during the RFP process, and uh, they're listed as a key personnel, and we want to interview them as part of the key uh, project team delivery members. And this role supports uh, the alignment between all parties, between the owner and the design build team, and also within the design build team itself to make sure that the Delivery personnel and the design team are closely orchestrated. This member provides transparency and accountability to our processes. They facilitate communication. They ensure just-in-time delivery of design documents when needed for procurement and construction. They meet our permitting requirements, incorporate stakeholder input, and meets 
the owner's aspirational objectives. At SFO, we prefer that this individual is an architect, has an architectural background, um, but we don't mandate that. Um, but the architects, the lead architect we found has that experience of not only orchestrating well the design work below them, but also hearing from the client the aspirational desires and funneling that into the design work that is produced. But as I've mentioned, this role isn't terribly well understood. In the early days of project delivery at SFO, um, builders would give us any member of choice in their team, generally maybe a civil engineer who can or, you know, get design documents out of the design team in a timely manner, but do those design documents meet what we want at SFO? They may not. So with the support of CII and the Charles Pankow Foundation, uh, we examined what is the role of this design integration manager, what qualities do they need to have, and what would make uh, for a good hire in this realm. And we came away with three primary takeaways from our study. Uh, to achieve the best results with collaborative project delivery methods, you need to be very intentional with the design integration process. It's a vital process. And if you do it well, you will achieve exceptional results, or you can. If you don't do it well, you really won't get the best out of your alternative project delivery um, project. Secondly, we understood well that design integration managers are needed through all phases of the project. They should be on board at project formation, team formation, and proposal development. And they need to stay on all the way throughout construction. Uh, I was talking with my team members earlier yesterday about how oftentimes at SFO, I'm disappointed when the builder wants to pull away the design integration manager once construction's well underway, thinking that their job is done. But I know that they need to stay to the end of the project, not only to make sure that everything is executed to the original intentions, but also because we as a client often add scope to projects and we want that incorporated well. And finally, we learned, oops, let's see. Uh, and then finally, we learned that a really good design integration manager will have strong, a strong technical background combined with well-developed social skills. It's very critical. And so who benefits from the research that we did? We know that the design builders will benefit from a smoother, more efficient process for project delivery. We know that the owners benefit from well-developed projects that are delivered quickly and efficiently, but also we benefit from knowing what to ask for in the design integration manager role during the RFP phase so that we get what the pro is in our best interest. Builders will understand the training and development needs for these design integration managers, and the designers benefit from coordination of their efforts, permitting facilitation, and they have an ally in meeting the owner's aspirational um, objectives. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian. All right, uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, so as the academic, uh, I get to talk to you about our process. So how we actually got from start to finish. Um, I'll talk a bit about what we did, uh, some of our results, and then how we took all of those results and converted them into a resource that's immediately usable by uh, the folks in this room. Um, and so our overarching process is what's referred to as job analysis. And so that is a industrial organizational psychology tool. It's basically designed to go and look at what a position actually does. And it's really good for this type of role where things seem to be very implicit and we need to make them more explicit. So we need to go and find out what it is that this particular role does in order to document it. So job analysis can produce things like job descriptions. It can be helpful, as Judy mentioned, in terms of training and development, getting people into this role, because this role ends up being very found. You kind of find yourself in this role. It's, it's not something that we necessarily train for yet. So what this process starts with is essentially gathering the information that we already know. 
So going out and looking at job postings that describe this role. And so there's not a lot of consistency here. So this role can go by many names, design manager, design integration manager, design phase manager, design build manager, engineering manager. They all kind of describe the same series of tasks that are performed by this one individual that, that we were sort of coining as the, the design integration manager. And then we were interested in some of the competencies that companies were asking for. So what are they looking for in this role? And this kind of gives us a starting point so that we're not starting from scratch. The next thing we needed to do was pull together the people that actually do this work. So go out and find design integration managers that are willing to serve as subject matter experts for our project. Okay, and what we wanted to do was find those people that do the work, but also some adjacent people. Okay, so we were interested in the interface uh, with this role. So Judy is an owner, right? She's not necessarily doing design integration management, but she interfaces with design integration managers. So she, know what, she knows what they should be doing, and she knows what makes a good one. Okay? So people like Judy were great to include within this group in addition to those actual design integration managers themselves. And you can see the breakdown of the actual SME group that we assembled. And this is 55 people or so. Okay, so a lot of them were that building construction sector, but then we did have good representation from industrial, highway, aviation, water, wastewater, um, and the federal sector. Okay, so a lot of federal owners and, and federal contractors were, were helping us as well. Okay, so we wanted to identify a diverse group that could help us represent the entire industry. Okay, then we wanted to pull them together. Get them all together in a room, sometimes at different times, 55 people is a lot. Okay, get them in, in a room together and have them tell us what it was that they do. Okay, we did this via research charrettes, which are essentially a workshop. So getting people just to tell us, describe your day to day. What do you do week to week, day to day, month to month, okay, project to project. And then tell us what kind of skills you need in order to do that work. What kind of competencies would you recommend that you see in yourself that help you be effective at this particular job? Okay, and we got a huge list of tasks and competencies for this kind of a role. Okay, way too many to actually make sense of, including some things like, oh, I check emails every day. Okay, everyone checks emails every day. All right, but that isn't really unique to this particular role. So what we had to do then was filter through. So have the, these SMEs then rank each of those tasks and competencies in terms of importance, frequency, um, you know, relevance in differentiating a great design integration manager from eh, just an okay one, okay? To help us really say what's really important for this particular role, and that helped us parse that list down, get it down to a more manageable core list of tasks for what this, this role um, actually engaged in day to day, okay? And then lastly, what we wanted to do was take that list of tasks, take that list of competencies, and link them together in a way that actually leads to some sort of development. So if you're assigned to do one task, what do you then need to know? What skills do you have to have? What abilities do you have to have in order to then complete that one particular task? Okay, so if that task is being completed by one person, great. If they have all the competencies, great. Sometimes it may need to be performed by actually a team of individuals, okay? But they, as long as they all have those competencies, they can make it work, okay? So that's the overarching process. What does this design integration manager actually do, okay? And so we really tried to break a project down into some kind of agnostic phases because I know we all work in different sectors and you know, EPC world is different from the building world. And so we started with five basic phases, okay? From pre-award, uh, through award, through early design, detailed design, and then, and then construction. Um, and obviously these phases, these phase names change a little bit depending on the sector. And across all of those different phases, we had 28 different tasks that we identified, okay? Across those five phases. And if we kind of explode this out and look at a traditional design build process, so not quite the progressive model that that Judy alluded to, but kind of a fixed price design build model, um, that's, this is kind of where these phases fall, okay? 
And I'm not gonna go through every single task that we had because that's boring and the guide has them all and the resource has them all and, and you guys can definitely read that on your own. I'm just gonna give you a, a sample. I'm gonna show you roughly what you'll, what you'll see. So in that pre-award phase, there were seven tasks uh, assigned to the design integration manager. And again, I'm not even gonna read all these because that's boring too. So I'm just gonna focus on a few. Okay, because this role is interfacing with so many different partners and trying to bridge design and construction, okay, a lot of the more important tasks focus on the teaming aspect of it. Okay, making sure that partners are bought in, making sure that they're helping to identify risks early on, especially during that pre-award phase, and making sure that if you're gonna get the project, if you are awarded the project, everyone's gonna hit the ground running. Okay? And that's just an example of the kinds of tasks that go to this individual. Okay, and every phase, all throughout, have their own set of tasks, which are all uh, summarized in the actual resource itself. So then we looked at the kinds of competencies that were needed. And we had 58 different competencies across what we used a KSAO model. So this is just a competency model. It stands for knowledge, skills, abilities, and other factors or other characteristics. Um, and essentially that other is a catch-all category. So it's for things like personality traits, like, okay, you're assertive, okay? Well, I'm not necessarily gonna train assertiveness. You kind of either have it or you don't. So it's kind of the nice to have bucket, okay? The other things you can train people in, you can develop them in. Um, and so again, I'm not gonna go through all of those competencies. I'm just gonna focus on a few. I'll pull up the knowledge competency list. So there were 13 different competencies related to knowledge, okay? We looked at procedural knowledge, factual knowledge, Again, I'll just zero in on a few things. Uh, this role is not the designer of record. It's not the engineer of record. So they don't necessarily need to know how to design something. They don't need to know the technical engineering knowledge that an engineer might. But they do need to know the design process. They need to know how it works. They need to know how it interfaces, okay? And so that's where things are emphasized in the particular resource that we're gonna share with you. Okay. It's really focused on what this particular role does in order to interface and bridge and align these different disciplines. And as Judy alluded to, the skills section really ends up being about 50-50, maybe a little bit more on the soft skill side. So being able to compromise, being able to negotiate, okay, being able to work with someone, being able to communicate, those are all skills that are highly relevant to this particular position, less so on the technical side. Okay, and so the last thing we did was link these. So just to give you a task, I'll give you an example, we linked KSAOs with, with each of these tasks. And those competencies could be provided by, as I said, one person or multiple people, however it needs to be distributed. You need to have these, this set of competencies in order to really be effective at this particular task, okay? And so ultimately, all of those linkages were brought together into a series of resources. The main resource is this Design Builder's Guide to Design Management. Okay, it's primarily focused on the building sector, but it's a good 166 some pages uh, of document. Okay, it goes phase by phase, and within each phase, what are the tasks that need to be done, what are the competencies that are associated with that task, and it guides you through. Okay, we had all those different sectors. We didn't wanna just throw away their, their expertise, and we quickly realized that design build varies depending on the sector that we're in, collaborative delivery varies depending on the sector that we're in, and so we created market sector specific playbooks, okay? So industrial has its own playbook that talks about EPCs and how that, the design integration manager role works within that EPC world. Federal has its own playbook and so forth. They're all designed to be supplemental to the main guide. Okay, to really, if you find yourself on one of these projects, you look at the main guide, and then you look at the playbook, and together you've got a holistic picture of what you should be doing if you're in that design integration manager role. So with that, I'm gonna turn over back, or back over to Mark, and he's gonna show you a little bit about the look and the feel of the guide, and then close us out. Thanks, Thanks Brian. So uh, basically, Brian and Judy talked about chapters one and two, and I've got the next 25 chapters to go through. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, um, so chapters, uh, the, the, the remaining bulk of the, the main guide is broken into those uh, phases of the, 
project, so uh, pre-award, post-award, early design, detailed design, and construction. So each one of those gets a chapter. And then the 28 tasks that Brian talked about are identified in each one of those chapters uh, where necessary. So a quick example. So you get a task name. In this case, it was negotiating a teaming agreement. How often does that happen once? Uh, where does it fall within the tasks within, within that category, meaning um, uh, uh, pre-award? And then what are the competencies, right? So that's really one of the most important components here. What are the competencies you're looking for for somebody to go actually negotiate a teaming agreement or create a team? And then a, a narrative about why and uh, what and why it's important uh, to do this on a, on a project. So that's what the rest of the chapters talk about. They go into that kind of depth for all 28 uh, tasks, and then they touch on all of those KSAOs that Brian mentioned. So let's bring that back to CII. So why is that important to CII and its members? Well, the design integration, integration manager, they're instrumental in creating and identifying advanced work packaging, uh, in, in, instrumental in industrial integrated project delivery. Again, as I said earlier, modulization and offsite construction. And finally, quality, right? Ensuring quality in engineering and uh, design deliverables. So back to our learning objectives, um, there we go. So hopefully now you understand a little bit more about design integration management uh, in collaborative project delivery. You should now be able to explain what a design integration manager does or whatever term you wanna give it for, for your sector. And then finally, recognize the competencies that you're looking for in a design integration manager. The one thing that I really love about this set of guides and playbooks is what we've never had before is something we could actually hand to an owner. So if you're trying, if your owner doesn't ex understand collaborative project delivery and what the skill sets are necessary to deliver that, you can actually give them these set of documents and they'll get a much better understanding for the staff and individuals they should be looking at for their projects. You can scan that QR code right now and you go to the Pankow Foundation website all of the documents that we presented here today, so the main guide and the uh, playbooks are available for free. It's a free download. Uh, and again, thanks to CII and the other institutions for making that possible. Um, so we encourage you to go do that. And with that, we've got a little bit of time left for questions. And if we can't get to them all, we'll be down in the VIP uh, area to answer more. Thank you. You want that? Okay. Let me grab her stuff. Thank you. All right, we have a little time for some questions. So we're going to start off with what is the difference between the design integration manager and the interface manager in a major capital project? So interface manager primarily related to the, the AWP side of it. Um, so we view the design integration manager as more of a, not necessarily the same. So I think an interface manager is, is fairly specific to AWP. Design integration manager would be someone who kind of uses or interfaces between that particular interface manager and some of the other stakeholders, including like external stakeholders, like for instance, um, the owner and, and more the owner's team. Okay, um, one more question. What types of training or education can help build effective design integration managers it's a two-part question. And how do owners make sure their projects have a design integration manager assigned? I can tackle training, I guess, and yeah, I'll let training. Judy tackle the owner part. Um, depending upon your sector, I would be looking for folks. I'm an architect. I'm not a contractor. I work for a contractor, but I'm an architect. So um, it's really helped me in the training that I received as an architect in managing design projects before going into the construction side of it, helps me manage that team um, in a, a much more effective way than maybe somebody who didn't go through that process, right? So it doesn't have to happen. So for instance, for a progressive design build, um, we try to assign a, a design-focused design manager, but for stipulated some design build um, or see them at risk, uh, somebody who's come up through our organization without that design background works very well in, 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 in those types of delivery methods. 
And I would say, as I mentioned earlier, you should be asking for this as a key personnel in your RFPs um, so that you ensure that you have someone in your team that you trust and uh, can do the job. But also, they should be very visible to us as owners and project people. Um, I think of the design integration manager as being probably one of five key individuals on the builder's team, from the project manager, the superintendent, the uh, superintendent for the job, design integration manager, and then uh, cost estimating and scheduling. We should know who all those individuals are. If you don't, you've got some weaknesses potentially. Um, but you should be able to see this person visibly in the project and be able to read whether they're effective at their job. Are you being heard if you're the owner, if you're the designer, if you're even a member of the builds team? Are you being heard? And that individual is the one who's the key to all of that. Well, we continue to get some great questions, um, but for the sake of time, we will continue to move forward with today's program. Um, but don't forget, you can continue to ask more questions at the CII VIP um, down in the Coral Room. And thank you again for your time. Let's give them a round of applause.